as we get started today, I'm going to embarrass a couple of people. There's some very special people from Dallas that came down here. It's Jimmy and Cecil Smith. Would you give them a good Austin welcome? Yeah. Yeah, it's good to see you. Let's just take a moment and uh, center in on that inner teacher. So we take a breath. Mother, Father, God, we're so grateful today for all the joy we've already experienced. And we know that it is the inner Christ that's our teacher. So we listen within and hear what you have to tell us. Amen. Amen. Okay. So today we are going to be talking about love is all we need and that love's there all the time, all along. So let's affirm this together and we'll do it our usual three times. So let's be conscious of what we're affirming here. And we affirm it not to make it true, but because it is true okay so let's affirm this together we'll get our affirmation up here it's not there but we'll just do it there it is it appeared here we go let's affirm this I live in the abundant ever-present love of God we take a breath and be aware of our heart settle in and let's affirm it again I live in the abundant ever-present love of God. We let that be real. We know it's the truth. In this final time, we align ourselves with this big R reality. Here we go. I live in the abundant, ever-present love of God. That's the truth, isn't it? Well, how come we don't always feel that way? I don't know. We'll find out. Okay. There was a man who uh, loved his lawn, and he took pride in it, took a lot of care of it, worked in it really hard, but he had a problem. He had those little yellow flowers all over it, called dandelions. And so he did everything he knew to do to, to see if he could get rid of those dandelions. And he tried this and he tried that, and he worked really hard, but still the dandelions persisted. And so he finally got so desperate that he wrote a letter to the agriculture department of the state university and told them everything he'd done and all he had tried to get rid of those dandelions. And uh, he didn't hear back from them for quite a while. And finally they wrote back and they said, Sir, we think you're just going to have to learn to love them. <laughs> we have dandelions in our lives, don't we? And those things have deep roots. You know, when I uh, have been digging the dandelions in my yard back in Olympia, Washington, I could almost guarantee you that there's some little gnome that lives under that yard and sucks those things down, you know. It's like you can't seem to get them out. You can't seem to get all the deep roots because they do. Those dandelions in our lives, too, seem to have pretty deep roots in our consciousness. They can show up in a lot of ways. Dandelions might show up as illness. They might show up as financial difficulties. Dandelions might show up as the loss of a job. Dandelions might show up as addiction. They might show up as disruption in our families. They can show up in ourselves. They can show up in our spouses and partners. They can show up in our children, our grandchildren. They can show up just everywhere, huh? They can show up in the church. <gasps> Dandelions in the church. <gasps> no. Yes. <laughs> they can because dandelions are everywhere. And you know what happens, too, after those yellow flowers come. We know what happens, you know. It makes the little pod and the wind blows and... And I always saw it was my neighbor's fault because they didn't clean the dandelions up. They'd blow in my yard, okay? So when we see those dandelions in life, you know, we have a lot of different uh, reactions to them. And oftentimes the first reaction to them is like this man, is how in the world am I going to get rid of those things? Do you do that in your life? When the dandelions show up, that can be our real focus. We can even obsess about it. How am I going to get rid of those dandelions? How am I going to make this problem go away? Sometimes we try to make it go away by pretending like it's not there. You ever pretend? Oh, if I don't see it, it's not there. Okay. Well, it is. Okay. If it's a fact. Or sometimes we try to get rid of those dandelions by blaming. We might blame other people. But you know what I find is, is so is that really we blame ourselves, I think, a lot more than we blame other people. So we get down on ourselves and we somehow think, how am I to blame for this? What did I do? So on and so on. 
Or sometimes we rush around and we try to get rid of those dandelions by spending, you know, a lot of time, energy, and money buying the next gimmick. You know, for how this, this person says if I do this X, Y, and Z, it'll get rid of these dandelions, whatever form they're in. And so we get a lot, we get real focused out there. But you know, what happens is a lot of times like that man, those dandelions don't go away. They seem like they persist even if we dig them out. Sometimes those roots are deep or it is the neighbor's fault. They blow into our yard. You know, they blow in there. And so it seems like we have a hard time, you know, releasing those dandelions. But what I want to do today is give us another <coughs> thought about what dandelions <coughs> might really be, those dandelions in our lives. Dandelions are a good thing because what they do is they bring us up against the limits of our understanding of our spiritual nature. I'm going to say that again. Dandelions are a good thing in our lives because they bring us up against the limits of our understanding of our spiritual nature because the dandelions really show up in our lives because we have reached the end of our resources when we just are focusing on the material experience. And that's the reaction. I want to fix it. I want to make it go away. And I feel overwhelmed. And I feel upset. And I want other people to change. That's a big one, you know. If they would just straighten up, then the dandelions would go away. So we have, but when we experience that frustration, when we experience that inability to get them to go away, it's what's happening is that now, hopefully, we have the opportunity to understand ourselves in a deeper way and to reach down deeper to what really is our source. What is it really that life is about? You know, uh, any uh, philosophy that just tells us that life is about living, uh, uh, kind of climbing up the ladder of success or having more, or having better, or looking better, or whatever, or getting everybody in the family to behave themselves, that is a shallow philosophy, and it will not get you very far because, you know, because we're going to meet the limits of that capacity to live like that. A real spirituality is always going to say, thank you for this problem. Thank you for the gift that it has in its hands because there are no problems without gifts in their hands for us, and there really is only one gift that problems have for us. Only one gift, and here it is. That gift is to know that God is here with us right now. That God's love is here right now. That God's love always with, was with us, whatever happened in the past, no matter how difficult it was, no matter how overwhelmed we felt, no matter how hard it was to seem to overcome it, no matter how painful it was, the reality is that God was there then with us, God is there now with us, and God will be with us tomorrow or in the next minute or in the next hour. The gift of the dandelions is always the opportunity to know not how to fix them, but to know that we have a relationship that is never going to go away, that's always been with us, that's here with us now, and that's the relationship with God. That's incredible. And that's, you know, all any of us ever really want to know. We think we want to fix it. We think we want the stuff to go away. Yeah, but, that, but that's not going to make it go away. What we really want to know underneath it is that we're loved, that we're valued, that we're cared about, and that we're not alone. That's all any of us really want to know. So all that running around we do, about trying to fix this, that, and the other thing. What's really going on is, God, I want to know that you're here. I want to know you love me. I want to know you value me. I want to know you care. I want to know you've got the power to uh, live through me so that my life is of high quality. And I want to know that you are with me now. That can be harder when we're looking back at the past. And every one of us has got things in the past that we're like, where was God? that one. I invite you today, if you will, sometime this week, as God guides you, as God guides you gently and lovingly to visit some of those places where you're the pfft, and ask God, where were you? Where were you? And I guarantee you 
you will get a response and it will be amazing to you. You will be so surprised and it'll be good. It will be good. You may have to walk through some pain. You may have to walk through some emotions to experience that, but I guarantee you, you will get a response and you will probably continue to get responses and you will be amazed that even in the darkest, most difficult, hardest times in your life, where you thought, for goodness sake, I'm all alone, and what's going to happen to me? You were not alone. God was there. God's not a rescue operation. We're always like, God, how come you didn't change the circumstances? And God says, I was there because I was transforming you. I was giving you the resources to deal with things. And now, as you can look back on that, <coughs> you can see the amazing perfection of your life, the wholeness of of your life doesn't mean everything was pleasant doesn't mean it was all rosy or good it means that it was whole it means that we were finding ways to be whole within ourselves and to finding ways to know that we are in relationship with God real spirituality will never tell you let's fix the outside real spirituality will tell you let's know your relationship with God let's help you to grow and find that presence and power within you around you in everything and everybody that's real spirituality and sooner or later as we're growing spiritually that's what we're all called to know let me share with you this reading from uh, the unity textbook lessons in truth it was the, it's called the foundational unity textbook written by Emily Cady a ho I, uh, a physician over a hundred years ago and a woman physician over a hundred years ago was quite a quite an amazing thing in itself and she was also a wonderful metaphysician a spiritual teacher so here is what she wrote and first she quotes a scripture and this is from the prodigal son which we'll be looking at in just a minute from the gospel of Luke she says uh, she references that and she says sometime somewhere every human being must come to himself Having tired of eating the husks, and that's a reference to the prodigal son story, he will arise and go to my father. And then she goes on. And again, she's writing this over 100 years ago, so it's not gender-neutral language, okay? Okay, all right. Each man must learn sooner or later to stand alone with his God. Nothing else avails. Nothing else will ever make you the own master of your own destiny. There is in your own indwelling Lord all the life and health all the strength and peace and joy, all the wisdom and support that you can ever need or desire. No one can give to you as can this indwelling Father. God is the spring of all joy, all comfort, and all power. Hitherto we have believed that we were helped and comforted by others, that we received joy from outside circumstances and surroundings, but it is not so. All joy and strength and good spring up from a fountain within one's own being. And if we only knew this truth, we should know that because God in us is the fountain out of which springs all our good, nothing that anyone says or does or that anyone fails to say or do can take away our joy. That's the essence of spirituality. As we know that indwelling mother, father, God, or in unity we often refer that to that as the Christ, that individualization of God in us. As we come to know that and relate to that um, and let ourselves open to that and let ourselves be consciously aware of God's presence, life gets a lot different, doesn't it? We all know that. We all experience that. And we're all growing in that awareness because, because when we have that resource, when we have that loving relationship, we find that life begins to uh, look a lot better because we know that we have that power within us. We can think about ourselves uh, in, in a sense, and in, in uh, Charles Fillmore, the co-founder of Unity, and all the metaphysicians talk about this. All of spiritual teachers talk about this in all traditions around the world and through all the ages. They use different terminology, but it's the same thing. It says that basically within our human minds, we have three aspects. We have the conscious mind, which kind of is what we walk around with and talk and, and so forth. We have the subconscious mind, which is all that is stored and all the memories and, and the, the good, the bad, and the indifferent that's stored in there. 
and then we have what we call the superconscious or the Christ conscious mind, and that's what Ron affirms for us every Sunday um, as we hear that beautiful sound of the bowl. The super, we're being raised to the superconsciousness, that Christ mind, that God mind that's in us. And so when we feel in our lives like things are adverse, what is it that we're growing? Does God live within me? Does God outside? Where is God? God is both inside and outside. And so what we're doing within our own being is bringing the conscious mind and the subconscious mind into alignment with our Christ mind or our superconscious so that what we're guided by is the God mind so that we're not being kind of moved around by those, all those unconscious memories. A real spirituality, an authentic spirituality, is always a spirituality of wholeness. It's not going to tell us to run away from the facts of life. It's not going to tell us to wait till the by and by. It's going to tell us that right here and right now you need to be whole. And that means you need to know your whole self. It means to know what's buried down there. You know, down there in the roots of those dandelions. Take a look at it. It's okay. Because with the power of God with you, there's nothing that's bigger than the power of God. And it's telling you to open up to that beautiful sunshine. And to know that with that, you can heal and you can go forward. This is a wonderful interpretation of this gospel story of the prodigal son. It's, uh, there are many levels of understanding of any uh, sacred scripture and certainly of the Bible. So this is one way of thinking about how we can relate to this story. So I'm going to read it uh, to you and I'm going to invite you to hear it on a lot of levels. And, and I'll invite you to hear it with your metaphysical understanding and we'll talk about that. This is in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15, starting with verse 11. Then Jesus said, There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to the father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. And so he divided his property between them. That's the aspect of us that's that subconscious mind and the conscious mind saying, I want to live out here in the world of materiality. I want to look out here and I want to see how I can climb the ladder and I want to see how I can fix it all and make it all work because I know how to do this. And we've all done that. We all do it. You know, that's, that's okay. That's part of life. So the Father, and the Father is the symbolize, symbolizes God within us. So the Father divided his property. Okay, so a few days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and he traveled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property. I love this, in dissolute living. Wonder, well, what was he doing? I don't know. Okay. So, well, it doesn't matter if you've, you know, been naughty. Okay. That's not what this is about. This story often gets interpreted like it's not what it's about. It's about the human ego, the conscious and the subconscious mind saying, I'll do it myself. I'm going to run my life. Okay. And you can look like a very good citizen and do that. Or you can have that dissolute, riotous living and do it, you know, or anywhere in between. But it's about the, that part, not knowing that God is our source. That's what it is. So what always happens when the ego's out there having this dissolute experience is it gets all squandered, doesn't it? You spend it all. You reach the limits of your ability. You reach the limits of your understanding. So he's out there in his dissolute, riotous living. That's the King James calls it riotous living. I like that. Okay. So when he had spent everything, he had reached his limits of what he could do by himself without understanding his source, a severe famine took place throughout the whole country. Isn't that how it feels? When we got those problems, it seems like it's not just me, it's everything's messed up. There's nothing anywhere. I don't have any resource. And it looks like it's a bad day. And so he began to be in need. Hmm. Now, the human ego says, when I begin to be in need, that's a bad thing. Back to the dandelions. I need to fix it. I need to fix it. I need to fix it. But the spiritual thinking, the Christ mind says, hooray, hooray. They've reached their limits. They've reached the limits. And so that's a good thing. A friend of mine calls this the gift of despair. The gift of despair. That's the biggest gift you can ever get is the gift of despair because it leads you to the real big gift is the gift of love. Because if you don't despair, you're still going to think you, you yourself, and I are out there doing it, right? I've got it. I've got it under control. Under control. Okay. This is the paradox in real spiritual living. You have to fail to succeed. 
You have to surrender to win. You have to let go to hold on. And you have to give it away to keep it. That's spiritual living. And I am here to tell you that the, the combination of the subconscious and the conscious mind are not happy to hear that. They don't like that. They don't want to hear it. They go, nee, 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 nee. Okay, they don't want to hear that. Okay? But the spiritual, the Christ mind is, yay. That's what it's all about. Okay. So we know what happened to this guy, right? So he went and he hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him to the fields to feed the pigs. Now, this is a story about a man uh, who was raised in Judaism where, you know, the, the pig was considered an unclean animal, so this guy was down in the dregs. And we do that, don't we? That's what I was talking about earlier. When we've got these problems and we're trying to fix them, we'll do, we're still, me, myself, and I out there, we'll do anything to try to fix it, to try to make it happen, and we will violate our own values. That's what this is about. He was violating his own values because he was so desperate and he didn't yet get it about what his real source was. So that's okay, too. That's good. Because when we are desperate and we get out there and we do whatever it takes, the good news is it gets painful. Pain is a gift because it invites us to look for new resources inside of us. Okay, so he would have gladly filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, but nobody gave him anything. Wow, he's out there. He can't even eat the pig slop. That's low, okay? We've all been there. Don't you tell me you haven't been there. Okay, in our own way. I have. All right, so in our own way, each in our own way. We've been down there. Okay, and that's good news. That is good news. Okay, but then he came to himself because he'd heard enough, and he says, hmm, how many of my father's hired hands have enough bread and, and to spare, but here I am dying of hunger. So he starts thinking, hmm. So he says, I'm going to get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you, and I'm no longer worthy to be your, called your son, so treat me like one of your hired hands. Now, this is another step in it, right? It's like, okay, okay, all right, I'm willing to believe there's God or something, so I'm going to make a deal. God, let's make a deal. He's playing, let's make a deal with God. We've all done that, too. Let's make a deal. Okay, you don't have to treat me really well, but just a little bit. Just give me, we'll make a deal, okay? I'll never do it again, if, okay? <laughs> All right. So he's going to play, let's make a deal with God. So you think this would irritate God, wouldn't you? Think God must be irritated with making deals. Okay, let's see what happened. We know what happened. Okay, so he set off and went to his father. And that symbolizes God, that presence around us, the presence within us. But while he was still afar off, his father saw him. Now, how do you think his father saw him when he was so far off? Because was God sitting in the house, watching TV, twiddling his thumbs? You know where that father was. He was out there every day, standing on the edge of his property, looking, looking for that son. When's he going to come back? I know he's coming back. He was out there looking for him actively. That's the presence of God in us. God isn't mad because we took our stuff and went out and experimented. God isn't mad because we wanted to make a deal. God is proactively, lovingly, spaciously, and graciously waiting and longing and looking for us all the time. All the time. God is never angry with us. God is never rejecting of us. God is simply gracious and just awaiting us to wake up. We're never really separate from God. That's our unity understanding. That's this beautiful philosophy. God lives within us, but we're not always awake to it. So God's simply awaiting us to wake up. That's the return to the Father, is the awakening, the realization of what that God lives within us. So God is proactively, lovingly, compassionately present. Love is there all along, all the time. And so we know that uh, his father saw him when he was afar off and he ran out and he put his arms around his son and he kissed him. And the son said, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. So he's still trying to make a deal, you know, because he didn't know how God's going to react here. But the father said to his slaves, quickly bring out a robe, the best one, the best one. And put it on him and put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. 
Let him be treated like the son that he is with the wonderful garments and the sandals of understanding. On his feet, my son has come home. This whole story is, t is, the, is the third story in a series of stories about finding what was lost. The first one's about the lost sheep. The second one's about the lost coin. And it builds up to the climax of the lost son, the lost daughter. I'm coming back to God, my father, my mother, my, the spirit that lives within me. I'm coming back to true source so I can truly live. And he said to the, the people, he said, get the fatted calf and kill it and let's eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead because he was living out there not understanding who he was, but now he's alive again. He was lost and he was found. And they began to celebrate. <sighs> That's the reality of the spiritual life. That's the truth about who we are. Could we want anything better? This is it. This is living in the wholeness and the fullness and the joy of God. My friends, love is here now. Love always was. And love's going to be here in the next minute, the next year, the next millennium. Love's always here. For God is always here. Let's pray. Mother, Father, God, we are so grateful, and we feel you right now. We feel your welcoming love calling us back to waking up to awareness of your power and your presence, your graciousness, your care for us, and we accept. Amen.